So honorable ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to all of you who are joining us today. I am Shay Gopal, the International Organization of Employers Special Representative to the UN in New York. And I'm delighted, along with our co-organizers, the Conrad Adner, Steve Dung, and the UN Global Compact to welcome you today to this virtual conference. We are particularly pleased that we have uh, Amina Mohammed, the UN Deputy Secretary General, uh, joining us today, as well as an outstanding group of intergenerational group of women leaders from both the public and the private sector, who are challenging the orthodoxies and paving the way for the next generation of women. With this distinguished and eclectic group, we'll identify the secret ingredients necessary to ensure that the COVID-19 recovery is transformative, inclusive, and equitable. First, some housekeeping rules. As I said, there is interpretation into English, French, and Spanish. And at the end for the Q&A, you can pose questions by clicking at the bottom of your screens. Also, I must apologize in advance. I must keep everyone on time because many of our speakers are moving on to other panels. So if I could just quickly start with a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. A woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong it is until it is in hot water. There is no lack of hot water these days. Women today make up 70% of healthcare workers. And industries most affected by the pandemic, such as retail, hospitality, tourism, are highly dependent on a female workforce. While women are some of the most vulnerable during this crisis, they have also proven to be some of the most effective leaders. Much is being said about countries led by women during this pandemic, such as New Zealand, Taiwan, Germany, to name a few, but they're showing exemplary results. In our panels and our discussions today, our speakers will look at their personal stories, attributes, policies, innovative thinking, challenges and opportunities as we all try to come back and build back better. So first, I, I have the honor to introduce our co-sponsors. First, I'd like to introduce Mr. Earl Curiseppe, president of IOE. You have the floor, Earl. Thank you, Shay. Hello and welcome to all of, who, of you who have joined us for this dialogue today. <clears throat> I am very pleased to see so many change makers, entrepreneurs and trailblazers in the fields of politics, business and society. On behalf of my colleagues at the International Organization of Employers, our partners at Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the UN Global Compact, who are co-organizing this event with us, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Ms. Amina Mohamed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations for joining us today as our keynote speaker. Distinguished participants, today's conference aims to amplify the voices of women in startup business and in managerial positions to explore how their leadership is shaping an inclusive, solutions-oriented response to the pandemic and how we can support best practice and initiatives, such as the Women Rise Old Initiative, which has united women leaders globally to take concerted actions to build back better. I am here on behalf of the International Organization of Employers, the largest private sector network in the world, with members in 147 countries worldwide, encompassing more than 50 million companies. Our members are committed to promote workplaces that are free from all forms of discrimination, including gender, and to ensure that decisions related to employment are based solely on an individual's merits. This is not only the right thing to do, but also in the best interest of business. This is why the IOE created its very own gender network in 2018, so that best practices can be shared among experts and managers. IOE partnered with many organizations 
to promote women's economic empowerment. This includes working with the International Labor Organization to compile best practices for women's economic empowerment across employers' organizations and companies. At IOE, we don't to just talk the talk, we also walk the talk. Last week, IOE joined with UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, to successfully complete a series of high-impact trainings to strengthen gender equality in the workplace by improving women's representation in corporate leadership. I am very proud to tell you all that we are joined here today by the graduating students of this training. Congratulations to all of you. Well done. Today's event is thus a special one for many reasons. 2020 also marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Today, we have more women in politics, in managerial positions, and at the apex of corporate leadership than ever before. But it is far from enough. While 70% of healthcare personnel globally are women and constitute the front line in the response to the pandemic, only 25% of global leaders whose policy decisions and actions will ultimately determine the success of the response to the pandemic are female. The proven leadership of women in business has emerged as a silver lining in the pandemic period, focusing on solutions-oriented initiatives, resilience, and risk-taking. There is an urgent need to tap into this positive change and accelerate our efforts to move from words to actions together. We look forward to a lively discussion and to the interventions and questions from our distinguished guests and participants. And more importantly, we look forward to following up with action-oriented deliverables. Thank you. Back to you, Shay. Thank you, Earl, for those welcoming remarks. And now I'll pass the floor to Andrea Ostemeyer de Souza, the Executive Director of the Conrad Adner Stiftung in New York. Andrea? Thank you, Shay. Dear Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, hosted jointly by IOE, UN Global Compact, and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. For a German political foundation that promotes democratic principles, human rights, and the engagement of non state actors in development around the world, today's topic about women leadership certainly is at the core of our agenda. Many of our programs and offices run activities in order to empower women in politics. Only with women shaping policies and regulatory frameworks can we be sure that the needs of those women who don't have a voice, who don't find the space they deserve, that those can be empowered so their full potential can enrich societies. Today's discussion takes place during a pandemic that emphasizes, intensifies, and directs our attention to the fault lines which have already existed before, particularly when it comes to issues such as gender equality, social inclusion, social protection, or access to health systems. If we want to build back better, we need to address those deficiencies and their underlying structural causes, be they cultural, traditional, systemic, or legal. Build back better in the sense of empowering more women necessitates a multi-stakeholder approach. It asks for strengths and partnerships and exchange with UN institutions, governments, as well as with actors from civil society and the private sector. 25 years after the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, we need to move beyond the talk and the declarations. We need governments who acknowledge and promote the leadership role of women and the added value they bring along. We need members of parliament who hold governments accountable and pass the appropriate legislation enabling women to develop and to employ their skills. We need a corporate sector that embraces women in leadership positions 
and develops a corporate culture that allows women to strive. But we also need more solidarity amongst women and more mentoring from women and men alike. Our first panel will particularly look into the context, the constraints, and the opportunities to improve diversity in a build back better approach. And I want to thank especially these four women who work closely with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for sharing their experiences today. I also would like to thank IOE, UN Global Compact and their members who are addressing in the second panel, the challenges and opportunities for women in the digital economy. I would like to thank you for this excellent cooperation because platforms like this can be a stepping stone for further action on a more operational level. And my final word of thanks goes to Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed. It is really an honor to have you with us this morning. You certainly are a role model for so many women worldwide. And you can remind governments as well as civil society and the private sector to move out of their comfort zones and to become creative and innovative in order to create the much needed space and possibilities for women. Ladies and gentlemen, we have this excellent lineup of speakers and I don't want to take away too much of their precious time. I'm wishing all of you a fruitful discussion and sincerely hope that in a year's time, we can discuss concrete steps of what has been done in order to seize the opportunities which we are going to identify today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. And very quickly, I'd like to pass on to our other co-organizer, the Global Compact. The floor is to Bo Bola Azola. She is the vice chair of the board of the UN Global Compact and former CEO of Standard Chartered Bank in Nigeria. Bola, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Shay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Secretary General, I echo uh, what Andrea said um, as our role model. Thank you very much for uh, being with us here today. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure really to, sp to be speaking at this event, a very, very important event. Um, we know that the global movements for gender equality are reaching all corners of the world, yet women are still clearly at a disadvantage, not only in the broader economic sense, but particularly as entrepreneurs. And, and the challenges that they face are, are, are myriad, regulatory, cultural biases against them, the lack of access to education, capital, market information, networks, and, and technology. And these barriers, including the unpaid care load, which you know, we've seen exacerbated by the intervention of COVID, um, hinder these women business owners and also prevent them from growing their businesses to scale. The theme today is from startup to, um, to uh, superstar, to stardom, and, 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 and that really is a major challenge. Yet the links between gender equality, women's empowerment, and sustainable development are well recognized. If women and men participated equally as entrepreneurs, global GDP could rise by 6% or $5 trillion. But despite a strong business and financial case, progress towards the SDG 5 on gender equality has been alarmingly slow. And now existing inequalities have been you know, further sort of amplified uh, by the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And the stark reality is that this crisis could reverse the limited progress that has been made over you know, the last couple of decades um, on gender equality and, and women's rights in the past decade. Um, for businesses to be part of the solution, they must ensure that women and girls are supported both during and after this crisis. And to make sure that this happens, one of the key recommendations of, of the Secretary General is to target women and girls in, in all COVID relief and recovery efforts. Uh, and in this case, uh, the private sector has a huge role to play. The Women's Empowerment Principles or the WEPs are a joint initiative of the UN Global Compact and the UN Women uh, that encourages and guides companies to advance gender equality in the workplace, market place and in the community and they're an effective way to respond to the call of the Secretary General for the business community to do its part to uplift uh, women. Uh, there were only 39 signatories when the webs were established in 2010 and I must say that 10 years later nearly 4,000 business leaders from every region of the globe have signed the CEO statement of support for the webs and, and counting. So all businesses really should be galvanizing around these principles to support women entrepreneurs and collectively promote gender equality. Um, and this would be a huge catalyst for social, cultural, and economic uh, ad advancement. And I please encourage all the companies represented at this event uh, uh, of all sizes to sign up to the principles and take action. Uh, 
to fast track progress, um, companies can also take the web uh, gender gap analysis because a lot of companies actually need help in progressing um, their gender agenda. And this tool anonymously um, helps assess their gender equality performance and develop a tailored uh, gender inclusive strategy. And to further uh, include a gender lens to their recovery efforts, um, businesses should imperatively walk the talk. I think that there's a lot of, you know, greenwashing, whitewashing, blackwashing, and so on, of what companies are doing uh, in, 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 in ensuring that they close the, the gender gap. Uh, the the um, UN, United Nations Global Compact also has a target gender equality program running collaboration with 19 of our local networks across the world. Uh, and, and this is really calling on all companies to set ambitious targets for women's representation and leadership in business, starting with the board and executive management level. It is an imperative. This includes target for procurement spend on women-owned businesses. So essentially the ecosystem and the value chain should be um, in included here. So no matter how small or large a company is, each of us has a role to play, particularly from the business uh, side in supporting womenpreneurs to grow from startups to stars and in advancing gender equality uh, as we recover from, from um, COVID-19. And as I close, um, this pandemic really will not be the last crisis that we face. In fact, it is not even the only crisis facing our world right now. And so we must work together to ensure resilience to future shocks and create a world where women and girls are neither the collateral damage, nor the bearers of the greatest burdens from global crisis. The world after COVID-19 will be defined by the actions that we take today. Uh, and when it comes to gender equality and women's empowerment, we, we must not slow down. In fact, we should actually double down. So I welcome you all to uh, this uh, event, and I wish the participants and panelists fruitful deliberations. I'm looking forward to uh, the, the insights that will be shared. And as we approach year end, I wish you all a happy and a healthy new year to come. Thank you. Thank you, Bola, for those uh, nice remarks this morning. So now, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to um, Roberto Suarez Santos, the Secretary General of IOE, to introduce our keynote speaker, Amina Mohammed. Thank you, Shay. I suppose that I can be well properly heard. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the distinguished speakers, guests, participants. I join my estimate colleagues, Harold, my president, Andrea, uh, Mrs. Bola. I also want to thank also Sanda, the executive director of the UN Global Compact, for joining us in this, in this virtual event. We, we, we have gathered here exceptional leaders from different, both public and private sectors worldwide from rising startups. And I want to stress the, the youth component of many of the speakers that will follow, uh, but also what we call shining start in their respective fields. This extraordinary group of women will share with us their expertise uh, and role model effects, but most importantly, I'm going to stress that, that they will help us to advance the agenda, the policy agenda that we need to advance. Uh, we all know that 2020 uh, has been and continues to be a testing time. Um, we, we, we normally refer to it to uh, a year with devastating social and economic consequences. And it's already clear that 2021 will also be quite challenging for many, for too many. Uh, this is putting a strong pressure on various aspects of employment including the gains that we have been making in gender equality at the workplace and beyond the workplace. And just let me give you an estimate from the ILO, the International Labour Organization, 400, 140 million full-time jobs will be lost. And women's employment is 19% more at risk than men. At the same time, inadvertently, the pandemic is reshaping the notion of female leadership. My word. Women leaders in uh, public and private sectors are proving they can not only recover, but also that they can manage in a much more powerful manner. They can lead, they can be critical drivers of change, of transformations and progress. And we need to leverage that. Yes, there are now a record number of CEOs in the Fortune 500, uh, the record number is less, but this record number is less than 8%. I mean, let's, let's be also critical on that. 
according to the gender parity index, uh, it will take us 95 years to close the gender gap in political representation. Not, we are not even talking about companies. And almost 250 years, or more than 250 years, to reach gender parity in the labor market. Unless, and that's an important point, we reevaluate how we do business. And that's the engagement that we have in IOE. And it's a very sincere engagement. I want to be clear. What we expect from this conversation is action, is deliverables. We want to commit, and we, we already started to commit to promote our women leaders in our federations. And believe me, our federations are the ones that have a key say in shaping policies at the global, at the local level. I, in that sense, we, we want to join the Right for All initiative. And uh, to some extent, we have already started, but we want to strengthen that. We need, to, and we are going to commit to strengthen this approach. And uh, also, we will be working on mentoring, on mentoring to young leaders in our federations that can also make a difference precisely to give a big push on this leadership. Uh, we need, of course, training, we need capital for women, we need credit, we need rights also, we recognize that. And we can achieve better results by alleviating also barriers and creating a more enabled environment. In that sense, I want to underline and highlight and thank Mrs. Amina Mohamed for her effort to join us for the Women Rights for All initiative, joined by many women leaders from around the world. We at IOE, we want to support this initiative to promote women representation and leadership. And that's one of the reasons why we want to join here. So without further delay, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much for joining us, Amina. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Thank you so much. Excellencies, our business leaders, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and many colleagues that I see online. It is a real pleasure to join you for this dialogue on supporting women entrepreneurs as we strive to recover better together from this COVID-19 crisis. I thank the uh, International Organization of Employers, the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, and the UN Global Compact for convening this event and bringing us all together. In recent decades, we've made significant strides towards gender equality, including in the private sector. Women's increased participation and leadership in business has proven essential in driving economic and financial performance. Today, the impact of COVID-19 is threatening those hard-won gains. Gender-based violence has increased and access to sexual reproductive health has been compromised. We're seeing an estimated 11 million girls likely to be forced to leave school before the end of the pandemic with potentially devastating consequences. Many may not return. Women are also those worst affected by the economic fallout of the current crisis, and they are more likely than men to own micro, small and medium-sized enterprises and vulnerable businesses in the informal sector. They're also far more likely to shoulder the burden of unpaid work, and they're less likely to have access to assets, pro property and financial services. Particularly concerning is the trend towards lower female participation in the workforce. Women make up around 39% of global employment, but account for 54% of overall job losses. In the US alone, more than 600,000 women left the workforce in September alone, compared with only 78,000 men. This reflects, among other factors, increased care burden falling disproportionately on women. Recent research from UNDP, UN Women, and the Pardee Center for International Futures of the University of Denver shows that by this time next year, 435 million women and girls will be living in extreme poverty, including 47 million specifically impoverished by COVID-19. By 2021, the findings indicate that for every 100 men aged 25 to 34 living in extreme poverty, there'll be 118 women. The impact of COVID on women threatens the achievement of the SDGs and hinders our work towards more inclusive, resilient, and gender equal sustainable societies. Indeed, women's long standing inequality holds back progress towards all the SDGs. As the World Bank has shown, the global economy could achieve, could achieve a gender dividend of $172 trillion by closing the gap in lifetime earnings between women and men. 
Therefore, narrowing the gender gaps in business ownership and leadership will go a long way towards generating stronger, more sustainable growth. And we have seen that when women succeed, they invest in their families and communities contributing to poverty reduction, education and improved nutrition. The UN Secretary General has put the world on high alert, calling to the end of the shadow pandemic of violence against women, to advance women's equal participation in decision making and to ensure targeted support to women in COVID-19 response packages. Women and women entrepreneurs must be put at the center of the, economic, the pandemic response and recovery. We need the public and private sectors to join forces in a gender sensitive response to this unprecedented emergency. And one example of an impactful response is the Women's Entrepreneurship Development Program of the ILO. This partnership empowers emerging and existing women entrepreneurs who want to start, run and grow their businesses. It helps them succeed in their own ventures, which in turn contribute to more inclusive, resilient and sustainable economies. In another key effort, the women's empowerment principles developed by the UN Global Compact and the UN Women have sent a strong message that advancing gender equality is not only the right thing to do, it's also a smart business strategy. To deepen implementation of the principles, UN Women and the ILO have established partnerships in several countries with employer organizations, business chambers and private sector companies. The UN Global Compact local networks in 19 countries have launched our target gender equality to help business set and meet ambitious targets for women's representation and leadership. And that's starting at the top. Initiatives like target gender equality are a response to Sustainable Development Goal 5, which really does require women's full participation and equal opportunities for leadership, including leadership in economic life. Women have been in the four lines in the response to COVID-19. They've played an enormous role in efforts to flatten the curve of the infection and position their nations for economic recovery. Yet the number of women in business management and leadership positions remains far too low. The Women Rise for All initiative that we convened earlier this year is intended to bring greater visibility to the effectiveness of women's leadership that we've seen during this crisis. The leaders in Women's Rise for All know that women's equal representation is not just a right in itself, it is a proven road to sustainable development and for better outcomes for everyone. Women's skills and talents, innovation, perspectives and leadership are needed to solve some of the world's biggest challenges, from tackling climate change to rebuilding our economies. There's ample evidence that when women are in power, their modes of governance support the well-being of entire populations in lines with the values of fairness, equity, peace, and human rights. Women who own businesses are women who, origi who originate, who lead, who adapt, who create. They bring this spirit to their families and communities, often going well beyond societal expectations of the roles women should play. And they will help us guide out of the crisis into a better future. COVID-19 is testing our common humanity and gender equality is both an imperative for building back better and an opportunity to tap our full human potential. We must not return to pre-pandemic inequalities. We need bold business leadership as societal struggles to rebound from the health and economic crisis of COVID-19. And we must do more than ensure that women are not left behind. We must let women lead. Thank you for inviting me to this very important gathering that deals with our women in leadership. Thank you so much, Amina. I'm going to, to raise to you precisely uh, linked to the last point that you have said. We, we must let women lead, but also we need to, to give a push and to, to help the policy agenda. And my first question to you uh, is how we, as business and employees organization, can work together, uh, together with the, you know, we are already uh, strengthening our links with the resident coordinators, with the global compact, but uh, also with many other initiatives. How can we really make a difference in terms of partnership to push the agenda uh, from, a, from a policy and also practical perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto. I think first things first, the Agenda 2030 still remains the frame with which we try to achieve and for it not to slide back or fall back, it's to put it forward and put it at the center of the stimulus packages and the response to COVID in country. 
Now that means that as we design those socioeconomic response and recovery plans, business also needs to be engaged. The pipelines of projects and programs that we will shape uh, need to be ones that they will invest in, they will partner with. So I think mm -hmm. it's very important right at the very beginning, mm -hmm. the mapping of the capacities of business in the country, the partnerships that we can bring mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. um, in planning uh, around the Agenda 2030 for which um, most mm -hmm. countries um, have that in frame. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is that the business practices already, looking at your business models that, that go beyond the social responsibility to ensuring that women are included at the center, that you're looking at your, your populations that are employed, you're looking at how to leverage perhaps the, the full value chain of the businesses that you are in um, and bringing them um, closer uh, to, to those partnerships. Um, for the UN, this is something with the Global Compact that um, one wants to go, the networks are rich, um, but bringing those networks in. Um, and I think here, putting an emphasis on young people young people, particularly young women, entrepreneurship and the startups that need the support. Um, and that support, um, I think that there are many ways in which this can, can happen looking at the context of which we find ourselves. Thank you so much. And, and, and this last also point leads to me to the, to the digital, digital uh, challenge that we have in front of us. And uh, sometimes we underestimate how important this digital digital drive can also help to the informal economy. And I know uh, very well, Amina, that you attach great importance to deal in a much more ambitious manner with the informal economy. But how can you see this digital digital leverage going forward um, with the help of all of us uh, to, to, to improve the, the women's entrepreneurship capacity, but also empowerment in all the sense? Well, you know, Roberto, there are many moving parts to this digital space. And the one thing we want to do is to try to close that digital divide. And so in the stimulus packages, really uh, bringing together the movement, business, civil society, um, uh, the, the multilateral system in ensuring that government itself increases the infrastructure for that connectivity. That's the first thing. It's not, mm -hmm. we are not as connected as we think we are. Mm -hmm. um, and once we do that, closing the digital divide will require digital literacy, capacity and skills. And we need to scale that up and we could have joint programs um, with civil society, with women's um, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, entrepreneurship um, businesses and business to try to scale that up. Um, on the one hand, governments try to provide, uh, to provide some space. It's not enough. The scale at which we need to get to requires partnerships um, to do that. And then to be very targeted, mapping where this informal sector is, where women are predominantly at the front lines of it, and seeing how we can migrate um, onto digital platforms. Uh, and, and I think that that's exciting, particularly for young women. This is uh, the tool of youth today, the future. Um, and I think that this is where um, we, we need to put more em em uh, emphasis. We've seen some really good role models in, in Latin America where over 300,000 businesses in the informal sector were migrated over a very short space of time. Um, so connecting markets, not just within borders, but across borders is going to be another huge advantage. And uh, in, in that way, the UN Global Compact's network um, establishes the, the possibilities of connecting with everyone. Um, and, and so not just getting onto the platform, um, but ensuring that that market space is available for us to travel. Exactly. I mean, this, this cross-border angle of the digital digital leverage is, is sometimes forgotten, isn't it? Uh, I, I would like just to, to raise a final question because we'll have here many women, uh, and many of them young women, uh, looking uh, at a profile like yours, accomplished leader. And it would be great to have some inspiring and coming Woman on the any secret formula, secret formula on leadership during a time like this, a time of crisis, a time of uh, of uh, you know of social of social still social challenges. Is there is there any word that you could convey to us on this? I think there is always strength in numbers. Never do this alone. You can you can uh, as they say birth the idea. But as much as possible, as we do, as women do, we bring together community. So bring together the, the like minds that can move a business. I mean, I have been um, in my life, I'm now the DSG, but in my life, I remember starting up a furniture company. I remember starting up a bookshop. And just because I saw a gap in the market um, and I just thought, you know, why not? I mean, uh, what is happening now is that we used to walk into bookshops. They were anything but a bookshop. They were always gift shops um, and they'd sold everything except books. And so I decided to, to show people what a bookshop should look like and how we should go about this and, and got together with family to do it. So, you know, have the idea, 
buy people into that idea for those that will invest, those that will run it, those that will um, help to network it, um, be very focused and, and, and know that it won't happen in a day. Enjoy the journey for making your business a success. Don't be in a hurry because it's the one building block to becoming from micro um, to, to your medium scale to right up to the very top. And I mean, look, we, we have uh, Bola Edeshola here, um, who's just a role model and a half, um, uh, many shoulders to stand on. So, you know, be focused, do it together um, and, and go, for, go for gold. I mean, I, I really just be very bold and courageous. Learn that the mistakes are a good thing. You learn from them. You, you trip up, you fall down, you go into a crack in the road, you get up and you get better from those, from those um, experiences. And, and, and this, this life is a journey, make each step count. You know, I mean, uh, this is the kind of language that we really, we really sometimes means because, you know, within the UN family, and we are part of that, we feel sometimes like a far away. And hearing that from you really makes a huge, huge difference. So I just want to thank you for your time, but also for your empathy. I think this kind of words that you have to be focused, but keep pushing and not, not desperate is a great message. And thank you so much. Um, if you can join us, that would be wonderful. But we also understand that you have a very heavy agenda. And then I go back to to the to to share with really the master of all this, who is now leading the, the discussion. Thank you so much, Amina. Thank you very much, and to the great women that are with us today. Thank you, Thank you Amina, for those inspiring words, and also for Roberto um, for all those really interesting questions. So now we will move on to our first panel. During this time of crisis, what opportunities are available to improve diversity through a gender lens and trying to build back better? I want to remind everyone there is a question and answer function at the bottom and also there is interpretation into English, French and Spanish. So I would like to introduce our um, moderator, Sanda Ojiambo, the Executive Director of UN Global Compact. Welcome, Sandra. And we have some of our panelists, unfortunately, that have to leave. So I leave the panel in the hands of our great moderator, Sandra, to make sure we keep everyone on time. Sorry about that. So the floor is yours, Sandra. And could all the participants to this panel please put your cameras on? Great, thank you, Shir. Thank you very much uh, to the IOE for inviting me to moderate this session. And we have an exciting panel with four esteemed ladies who I'm truly excited to, to moderate in this session. So in the interest of time, I'll just do a brief introduction uh, of the four ladies and we'll dive right in because they have lots of examples and lots of interesting life lessons to share. Um, you know, the context has been set about the issues that we want to discuss. Gender inequality is indeed one of the world's greatest challenges, but it is also one of our greatest solutions to building back better and certainly more inclusively. When women are empowered and when women are leading, economies grow, businesses flourish, and certainly communities thrive. So I look forward to this panel where I welcome four esteemed ladies. The first is Dr. Seema Samar, who is a state minister for human rights and international relations from Afghanistan. Elizabeth Moshman, who is a member of parliament in Germany. And Juko, who is the CEO of Standing Bank Uganda. And Laura Raffo, who is an economist, a businesswoman, an electoral candidate for Montevideo in Uruguay. Thank you very much for joining us all here today, um, esteemed panelists. Um, I'd just like to kick off with a question first for Seema. Um, Seema, Your Excellency, you know, currently Afghanistan is not only facing severe economic challenges due to the pandemic, but also unfortunately frequent surges of, of violence. I know that your government has entered a crucial stage for negotiations with the Taliban. And when we talk about building back better in the Afghan context, there are indeed a number of challenges. The post-pandemic situation, post-conflict, and of course, the Taliban. So I wanted to know, Your Excellency, from your view, um, and given the, the traditional Afghan culture, what is truly needed to safeguard the role that Afghan women can play in society today? Uh, well, uh, good morning to all of you, or good afternoon to the people who are living in a different part of the, the world. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be part of this, uh, this program and thanks to the organizer for including me in the program. 
Well, as you already said, that we are living in a country with 43 of years of war. Different groups of, of uh, people came to power and gone, but the violation of human rights continued, in particularly the violation and discrimination against women continued in different level. And still Afghanistan is unfortunately is one of the worst country for a woman, as you call it. Uh, we still remember the, the, uh, the gov government of Taliban uh, um, 20 years ago, which they practically put women in prison at ho house, under house uh, arrest. And Afghanistan was the biggest country uh, or the biggest in, um, prison for, for uh, half of the population. And we also know that the, the, the group of the people that we uh, are fighting against the government is the most conservative and backwarded people. I mean, we have a lot of Islamic countries around the world, but you see the, the version of Islam that they are really uh, imposing on the people and particularly on women uh, in the country is, is really harsh and very unique. It is not uh, because of Islam, it's because they, their interpretation of religion. And having the 43 years of war in the country, of course, uh, in every other countries with conflict, uh, put women uh, most of the time in isolation and also put the, 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 even the male member of the family is trying to uh, put us under restriction in order to so-called save their, their honor and save the, the female member of the family. <coughs> and it reduce the access of women to education, reduce the access of women to, to the healthcare and particularly to reproductive health. And you know that Taliban was, was not allowing women to see any male doctors. <coughs> and we did not forget the, the rule of Taliban in, in uh, our country. <coughs> So I think the, the, particularly the COVID is also have had a very negative impact on women. And it is mainly on women who are living in the bigger city because these are the women, I mean, first of all, it's highly populated. And most of the women who lost their male member of their family are so-called the breadwinner. And they are the one who had the family and um, keeping all those children because of their access to uh, reproductive rights and contraception, uh, most of the family has at least six, seven children. So the burden of those children is on the shoulder of the, uh, the female member of the family and mainly on the shoulder of the, of the mothers. And then the, also the tradition that we have in Afghanistan where the female member of the family either belong to the, to the father's family or belong uh, as a property or belong to the, the husband's family. When usually when they lose the husband, then the, member, uh, the male member of the family, the husband's family is trying to either force her to marry the other brother or to, uh, to stay, uh, not to allow her marry because they will take the children. It is unfortunately a very conservative tradition. So the impact of the of the conflict uh, on women increased the number of child marriage, of course, and increased the number of uh, forced marriages. Uh, of course, after the fall of the Taliban, we have uh, some achievement on this front and promoting women's uh, equality and ac their access to education give them more uh, the more. Uh, facility and opportunity to be empowered. But <clears throat> this is not the case in every part of the country. Yes, we have for first time in our history, we have equal rights in the constitution. Um, we had equal rights for the citizens, but they were not refusing to mention the, the word woman. In 2004, when we had the new constitution after the fall of Taliban, we add the word woman in the constitution. And for first time our, in our history, we have uh, criminalize the domestic violence. Uh, it is an elimination of violence against women law, which is enforced by the, uh, by the uh, signature of the president in 2009. But still, because of having those conservative within the community, within the parliament, uh, they refuse to pass the law as it is. It is not perfect, but it is giving some kind of a protection to, to women. Uh, to against the, the violence against them. 
Uh, but it's, uh, we still struggle with the parliament because we have st very conservative, strong men who really take hostage the law and the women's rights in the country. Uh, recently, we had another law, which was the protection of children. They, they stopped it because the, the age, the, the children age, which is 18 uh, everywhere, in different laws, we have the, the same age. But when it comes to the protection, they do not accept the age of the girls to be um, the child, uh, female child to be 18. And they keep saying that as soon as they reach the puberty, then they are uh, they're adult. You know, unfortunately that is the case. Although uh, that's why they really promote the child, uh, child marriage in the country. Uh, but what we have done so far in the country, I would say that uh, what we should do. One, I think we should focus on uh, education for women, because if we have the facilities for education for the women uh, and those in some of the area of the country, they are doing much, much better. And they are much better than their male uh, counterpart in the country. Uh, and they are become aware of their rights. And that's also some a strong tool to stand for, uh, for their rights and uh, against the violation of their human, human rights. Uh, number two, I think their access to uh, reproductive rights is really key to empower them because uh, they will be able to choose the number of their children. They cannot be a good professional if they have eight children or 10 children. Uh, during their uh, adult life, usually they are uh, either pregnant or they are breastfeeding. That is too much and they, they can't really do become a professional, for example, police woman or professional uh, a medical doctor. The third point that I think that we should focus also uh, on projects, on research-based fact uh, issues within our society. We might be able to use the, the experience of other countries, but it should be based on the culture, on the uh, social, in political environment of Afghanistan. And that will be more successful project to do it. Uh, the, Thank the you, Dr. Sima, I'll, I'll interrupt you there just because I think you've highlighted three very important areas and our speaker's actually going to talk to those a little bit later. I'll come back to you time allowing, but I think we take away very importantly that education is critical, uh, access to reproductive rights, very important, and also research. Uh, just in terms of practices and what is best from a legal and legislative perspective. Um, I, I wanted to go over to Anne. Anne is the CEO of Stanvik Bank Uganda, as I had mentioned in the introduction. And Anne, I just wanted to hear from you. Obviously, you have made it through that proverbial glass ceiling, as they say, and now the CEO of Stanvik, one of the largest banks in the country. But I wanted to know what lessons have you learned throughout your corporate career and what lessons could you pass on? I mean, earlier the DSG talked about how we must help each other rise. I'm wondering what, what plans, what lessons have you learned and what plans do you have to encourage and promote young women who are seeking leadership positions as well? Thank you, Sanda, and good afternoon, everybody. It is a real pleasure and a real joy to be here with you today. So I, I have a very little a short span of time. I could tell you a long story, but I'll brief. In brief, there are things that we must do for us to make the progress we need to make. And I'm gonna take all the other speakers' uh, words as, uh, as, uh, as, as having rung true. The first one for me is to create, to plant that seed of belief. Belief mm -hmm. that, 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 that the girl child, despite being faced with so many reasons why it cannot happen for them and why they cannot succeed. And despite society putting them in this very small little box, we have to start to, encourage young girls and give them reasons to believe that it can happen and it should happen. And the second part of, of, of this is uh, we talk about policy making and making the laws and legislating it, but it's one thing to legislate something, it's another to put it into practice. So we have to all use our platforms everywhere, wherever you are, to tell these very positive stories which reinforce belief and which also show the young girls that if Sander can do it, so can I that it's possible for them. And, and, and that it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, an ordinary girl with the right seed of belief and support can make a difference. 
The third, which is equally important, is we, we have to find a way to get the men or the male part of the society to join into this campaign. This is not a, a women's rights issue. This is a human rights issue and it touches all of us. So, so uh, if we focus our efforts on the women and the site, we will miss the point. We have to get as many men from across all sections of society to be part of this conversation. They have to be seen to be supporting. Already as it were, they're occupying the positions of power. They're occupying the policy making seats. We must get them to accept that this is a huge part of the agenda and get them to adopt and drive this. It's very, very critical. The, the, the other part for me is uh, the corporates and, and the others, the corporates, this is not an, I mean, I, I was watching the other day that for the first, this is even Wall Street where you'd think there's progress. They only got their first female CEO on it, of an international bank very recently. And I think it's Roberto who said earlier that 8% of Fortune 500, it's not enough. So, so we, we, we have to continue to beat the drum. This story is nowhere near finished. And for me, from a personal point of view, the other lessons that I can share are, are, are lessons of hard work, lessons of perseverance. Uh, my first few years of working where I used to work as a currency trader. And I sat on a floor where I was the only girl for the longest time and many a time. Uh, I, and I could forgive, I was mistaken for the tea girl uh, because I mean, there was just no girls on the trading floor. What could they possibly be doing there? But you, the, the, the having the resilience to remain and to hold on. And, and many a time women and girls have wonderful ideas. They have, have full potential, but we just don't have the confidence and the belief to push and to continue. So to hear positive stories in different parts of society uh, to, to share in these society, to share in these stories across different parts of society would be one of the key ways in which we start to unlock this thing about, because everything starts with believing. You gotta believe uh, because the ideas are there, but if you don't have the belief, you'll never reach out for it. You don't have the, you never go for it. So belief is gonna be very important. I heard a lot about policy making, but policy making is not enough. We have to get it to the grassroots level from a cultural practice point of view, because you can write it in the law all you want. If the culture, the practice is different, you're gonna get a different result. So yes, we can be in policy making, but we have to influence uh, the, the, other, the different fabrics of society. Sandra, I know I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna pause here. Thank you, and thank you for sharing very practical lessons. You know, you've talked about first belief, uh, and also just the need to ensure that legislation and policy really meets culture and reality. And that really leads me well into, into the question that I had for Laura, who, as I mentioned, is an economist and is currently an electoral candidate for mayor in Montevideo. Laura, great to have you here. So you have gained insights into two worlds, politics and the private sector. And I know that you've reached out to women in your program that's called Endeavor to enhance the number of women entrepreneurs in Uruguay. And I wanted to know your views on politics and the private sector and what we can really do to enhance women's aspirations as, as both leaders and entrepreneurs from your view. Laura, you're on mute though. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Sandra. And it is a great pleasure to be here today and to share with you uh, this panel. During the last 20 years, I have developed my career in the private sector and I've become an advocate for equal rights and equal pay for women. And I also created networks to help women entrepreneurs. It was only this year that I decided to step forward and became a political candidate. And in this, this, this 10 months, because it's only 10 months ago when I started as a political candidate, I learned a lot. And what I learned is that barriers that face women in politics are even harder than the ones that we face in the private sector. But both words have similarities. I would like to share with you some similarities I found. Uh, first of all, in, in Uruguay, as in other parts of the world, of the world, women are underrepresented in all decision-making positions. In the private sector, 
the percentage of women in managerial position is below 20% here in Uruguay, and women CEOs are less than 5%. And in politics, numbers are also discouraging. Women represent 19% of Uruguayan parliament, and in the present government, we have 13 ministers, but only two are women. We have never had a women president, but for the first time, we have a female as vice president. And this underrepresentation cannot be explained by objective reasons, because here in Uruguay, there is no gender gap in education. It is different for, from the experience that we heard um, from Afghanistan, of course. Uh, here, women with university degree are more than men, and the participation of women in the workforce is high. So the real reason for this lack of women leaders rely in subconscious biases that reproduce behaviors both in the private and the public sector. Today, I would like to share with you some of these conducts that I find they are similar in private and public sector. The first behavior is that in the corporate world and in politics, very important decisions are made during informal meetings after working hours. In the corporate sectors, decisions such as open a new branch or hire a new manager can be made during a golf game or a networking cocktail. In politics, it's the same. This type of conduct happens too, but even in more closed circles of power. After long days at work, political leaders used to gather by night and they make decisions that affect the next generation of leaders. The bad news, as you all know, is that women are not represented at the golf game or in those male circles. We just participate in networking cocktails and other events, but we do not participate in the most important ones, the ones that can shape our future, because we are not invited. So uh, I also have good news, is that we as female leaders, I believe that we can address to male leaders and explain them that the circles that they create are perpetuating the glass ceiling. And the truth is that when you talk to male leaders, they realize you have a point. They start to get conscious about how their actions can affect the future of women and thus the future of the country. In this area, I had a very good experience because I finally decided to create my own circle, inviting political leaders to have dinner at my home. And of course, that is only a first step because it's about including women in the, in the existing decision-making process. But I believe that in the future, women leaders can contribute to create new ways for decision making, more fair and more professional. Uh, another hurdle that women have to face both in, in political and private sector, both as entrepreneurs and political leaders, is fundraising. When I work with women entrepreneurs, I realized that it was really hard for them to raise capital. In Latin America, venture capital is not as developed as in the US or in Europe, but, the, but that factor is not the real barrier for women entrepreneurs. Actually, some investors simply do not trust in ventures led by women. It is incredible, but it happens. I remember one case of one female entrepreneur after a fundraising meeting, she received a no as an answer. And of course, she asked for feedback. And the CEO of the fund told her that as she was facing a divorce, she will not have the time to focus on the business. So uh, in, polit in politics, the fundraising is very important too, because you need to build a campaign to create a team. You need money. And donors are used to finance campaigns for main leaders. So building a network of people and corporation willing to contribute to your campaign as a female leader is not easy. That, that are the two experiences I, I wanted to share with you today. But of course, we can find a lot of similarities regarding barriers that women face in private and public sector. 
I, I believe Laura, that, yeah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Very, very important ones. I mean, you've talked about fundraising and, and fundraising and politics as well as, you know, that example of what happens at the golf course is, is a very critical one um, and where decisions are made. But the, both really shape leadership. And I, I wanted to move to um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Motchman, who is a member of the German parliament and just picking up on the question of, of leadership. Um, to Elizabeth, you know, to the rest of the world, Angela, uh, sorry, uh, Germany is is a beacon for gender equality with Chancellor Angela Merkel truly leading the way in, in really strong uh, leadership for the last 15 years. However, sometimes the statistics tell us that the representation of women at the top level hasn't always translated into better representation in other leadership roles. And I was wondering, uh, for you and from where you sit, what are some of the reasons that women are not reaching these high profile leadership positions? And could you give us just one or two suggestions in terms of what we must do to remedy this situation? Um, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Senna, for inviting uh, me. I, I'm very pleased and honored uh, to discuss with you. When Sima uh, told us that Afghanistan is the worst country for women, I would like to say that Germany is the best country for women. Because of Angela Merkel, everybody thinks that we are very, very good. But I have to, I'm disappointing, disappointed, and I have to say we have still great problems. Uh, with regard to women in leadership. And I will give you some examples. In our parliament, in this period, there are 30% uh, women. In the last period, we have had 36% uh, percent, uh, of women. And uh, that means there are less women in this period than there were in the last period. And this is a quite is quite simply a shameful state of affairs. And um, if politics are not better than the private sector, it's bad. And I will tell you, I I belong to my party, the Christian Democratic Party, the party of Angela Merkel, since 1976. And uh, in this time, I, I tell you what we were discussing. Uh, four points. First of all, the balance between family and work. Uh, secondly, returning to, to work after having a family. Uh, thir third point, the gender pay gap. And fourth, more women in leadership roles, more women in parliament that is more than 40 years ago. And since then, I am fighting for women uh, in, in leadership wherever. And uh, I could give you another uh, example in our, um, uh, in the history of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, since 70 years, we have about 700 secretaries of state as, uh, as civil servants. And there were only 30 women. There are 700 men, 30 women. And there were more, more men who, who um, uh, with the name of John than there are women a very, very bad, um, um, was heißt, um, percentage. And therefore, uh, yes, we have the wonderful Angela Merkel and we are proud of her, of course. But that doesn't mean that we have no problems with women in leadership. And uh, it's uh, the same in executive boards uh, and um, we, we ask for one woman if there are three, uh, three, 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 um, Vorstände. Members of the executive board. Members of ex 
executive ex 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 boards. Uh, now we we try to have one woman. That's not much, and the same is in the supervisory board. The quota is better, thirty percent, but uh, that's not good as well. That means we have to fight. We have to to do a lot of things to get to get a better better result. Oh. Could you tell us, Elizabeth, maybe just two practical actions that, that you feel and as a woman in leadership that, that you can take or you have taken to address some of these imbalances? I know the road, as you say, the statistics speak for themselves. What are some of the practical actions that women in, women in leadership could take? Uh, we have to, uh, to change Gesetze, uh, laws, that's our... Uh, that in this moment we try to, uh, to change uh, laws. We, we try to have, um, um, we have equal, pol uh, equal positions for men and, and women on the lists of uh, the parties. And um, we try to get more members in our parties. That's a big task because if they are not member of the parties, you can't recruit uh, women for responsible uh, positions. And therefore there we are bad. I think in our party at 30%, something between 26 and 30% women. That's not enough, you know, because we always hope that men elect us and uh, they try to, uh, to say who of us will get in a higher position and that's bad as well because uh, women have to decide who will become a better position or a lead or a leader posi position. I'm sorry for my English because I don't speak everyday English. That's uh, okay. I think you've passed, you've passed the message very well. And what I want to say, it's all right. And then I, I always tell women, you have to have more self-confidence because many women, if they are asked for a leader position or for another position, uh, they ask themselves, am I up to that? Am I right? Uh, am I the right person? Am I, uh, am I good enough? And they ask themselves many questions and they are not, they have to say, here I am. I want to, uh, to make it. And uh, I think we can make it because uh, women are well educated in our country, for example. We, ha we have many students, even 50% of the students are women and they make very, very good examinations. They have good notes. They go to, to foreign countries. Uh, they practice in, in uh, different uh, companies. They do everything, but in the end, uh, men will have uh, the leader positions and women try to have uh, leader positions. That's our big problem. Challenge. I'm, I'm not glad that uh, the result of all our work since many, many years is not better than th that. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for highlighting actually a very practical challenge. Um, I think if I tie together what I've heard from the speakers, you know, education, empowerment is critical. Self-belief is very important. We can't challenge these orthodoxies by dealing with just one gender. We need to bring men to the table as well to really address what empowerment and opportunities look like for women. There's lots of traditional networks that perhaps uh, stop women from progressing as they should. We need to challenge those networks or develop our own, certainly as Laura has shared with us. And most importantly, I think from Elizabeth's uh, comments, it does take time for these changes, but progress is 
steady. And I think challenging those orthodoxies is what is truly critical. So I, I really want to thank this esteemed panel, uh, Seema and Laura and Elizabeth for sharing all of your lessons with us. Um, very, very insightful and certainly food for thought for all of us as we continue to address some of these harrowing statistics on the gender gaps that exist. I'll hand it over to Shia. Thank you all very much, ladies, for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and to the panelists. There was a fabulous discussion there and so many lessons to be learned. Um, I would like to remind everyone again, there is interpretation at the bottom of your screen. You can click to have Spanish and French and also the Q&A at the bottom. We've had several questions raised, but fortunately we have such esteemed and great panelists. Many of the questions are actually being answered as they speak. So now I'm, we will take questions and answers at the very end. Um, I now move on to the second panel, Womenpreneurs Challenging the Orthodoxies on the Secret Ingredient to Recover and Grow in the Digital Economy. I'd like to pass this over to Roberto Suarez Santos, the IOE Secretary General, who will moderate this panel. Could the panelists please um, put your videos on now? Thank you. Over to you, Roberto. Thank you so much, uh, Shay, again. I have to say that my moderation role is, uh, is going to be easier uh, than uh, the Sanda. And thank you also, Sanda, also for, for, for engaging with us, because the panelists themselves have organized among themselves also to have a dialogue. So that's, that's going to be easier. But I just want to introduce them. We have Elizabeth Basket with us. She's the co-founder of Web Connect, and the most important part of this initiative which is called We Connect, is that it's an initiative to identify, educate, register, and certi uh, certify women's business enterprise that are at least 51% owned, managed, and controlled by one or more women. So this is basically a very uh, hardcore women entrepreneurship uh, initiative, an organization or a company, and we welcome the Elizabeth to join us. Uh, we also have with us, uh, and I hope that I pronounce it rightly, if not, please correct me, Gagandeep uh, Kibular, uh, an, India te an Indian technologist, and we know how important in India is uh, technology. I mean, I have to say this is one of these countries that have really make, make a huge step forward in terms of IT development, but also she's an entrepreneur in an, in an area which is data analytics, but the data analytics linked to a social purpose. Uh, and the initiative is called Superhuman Race. So thank you, thank you, Gagan, for, for joining us. We also have Jasmine, Jasmine Begum, uh, who is working for Microsoft. Well, Microsoft in Malaysia, but also in new dealing with new markets. I mean, we don't, we don't need to introduce Microsoft, but the important element is the work that uh, Jasmine is undertaking on legal and policy engagement and communication for the company. And it's great to have such a, such a good profile among us. Last but not least, we have Marie Dina. Uh, she's the founder of, a, of, a, of an NGO whose name is Food for Thought. Uh, and also beyond that, uh, she has been working for 15 years on the hospitality sector with the hotel brands such as Hilton, Marriott, Four Seasons. So she has a very, very inside uh, experience on how, how challenging it is for, for a woman to to become a, an entrepreneur and also how challenging it is also to set up a, a new organization like the NGO that she has set up, which is, uh, which is uh, amazing. So I, I just want to start the conversation uh, asking Elizabeth one very specific question. What's your advice to all the women trying to start their own business, especially during this critical period or to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General, to you and to your team and such amazing partners at UNGC and others for organizing this important event. I'm really looking forward to this discussion with Gagan. We Connect International works with very large buyers such as Microsoft um, and women owned businesses based in over 100 countries. And these buyers represent over a trillion dollars in annual spend on products and services. And they are deeply committed to finding more women owned businesses that can supply innovative and cost effective products and services. 
I find that the common characteristics of the most successful women business owners in our, in our network is their passion, their ability to anticipate and meet demand, and especially now, their resilience. Today, it is critical for women business owners to very carefully review their business model to make sure they have a market for their goods and services because so much has shifted. It is you know, really important that if there is no clear demand for their offerings over their next over the next 12 months, it's important that they be willing to pivot their passion and their expertise towards a service offering or a product line that they think buyers will actually pay for, and then to invest in those changes to their business model. It's a big ask to make those kinds of investments, especially right now. But I do see that the businesses that are most successful that are the ones that are willing to take the risk to try some new things. I'm encouraging the women business owners to join We Connect International because it's free, but it's a way to use online technology to register their businesses in a multilingual platform It'll just make it easier for large buyers to find them and for the women business owners to connect with each other so that they're not alone on their business journey and that they can work together to share best practices, to do business together, um, to invest with each other. Um, but definitely becoming more comfortable with technology is going to be absolutely critical for business su uh, success in today's environment. And um, it's one of the best ways to continue to serve uh, current customers and is one of the only ways to access new markets during a pandemic. So for public, private, and civil society organizations in this discussion today, as well as individual buyers, I'm encouraging you to find out how much of your annual spend on products and services is with women-owned businesses. That's because how we spend our money actually says a lot about what we value. So if you are truly committed to women's economic empowerment, you or your organization, the first thing you need to look at is how you spend your money. And then work to ensure that at least some of that money is with women and other groups of underutilized businesses. And finally, if you deliver or support projects focused on women business owners, please ensure that women are trained on how to leverage technology to grow their businesses so that we start to demystify technology and promote it as an entrepreneurial enabler. So Gagan, you have a background in engineering and you've held leadership roles in male dominated industries such as aerospace, data science and technology. Do you think there's a way to improve women's participation in STEM fields? Thank you, Elizabeth, for the question and for the very insightful introduction that you gave to us about WeConnect. I think this is exciting. So even before we delve deeper into women's participation in STEM, I think I want to take a minute to sort of explain the pervasiveness of STEM in our lives today. So as someone who spent their entire career in STEM, one of the things that confounds me today is the limited notion of it to the common people, right? So when people think of STEM, they're imagining this researcher who's tinkering in a lab or a rocket scientist, but STEM is everywhere today. The way we get food to the table, the way we contextualize fashion or get access to products, like you said, or even the way we hail a cab, it's no longer a gesture, right? You're doing everything using science, technology, engineering, maths today, right? So given the reality that we are in, I think it comes as no surprise to anyone that this should be the fastest growing highest paying sector in terms of job outlook, right? So with STEM, I think in the US alone, where you're based, more than 60% of the income and opportunity is going to be in STEM job roles, right? And that is, that is phenomenal. And it would have been even better if we had gender parity in STEM, right? So as the world embraces technology to a greater extent, the stark reality that is dismal that comes to light is the fact that we are very, very underrepresented within the STEM field. So
So there was a lot of talk. I think two or three leaders touched upon the fact that only 8% of all CEOs for Fortune 500 companies are women. And when this fact came to light, it was disappointing. There is a fact that is even more disappointing than that, right? So when we look at STEM numbers in terms of enrollment, right? So getting your foot in the door for something that is going to have 60% of income and opportunity increases over the next decade. It's 3% of women globally that enroll for sciences, 5% that enroll for mathematics and statistics, and still single digits. So we peak at a single digit 8% for engineering. And that's not even the worst part. The worst part is that, you know, so there's, I'm sure you've heard about the Gina Davis Institute and what they've done is phenomenal. They use machine learning to sort of look through Hollywood, popular media and analyze films to see the representation of women on screen and then compare it with reality. And usually reality is a little bit better than what happens on screen. But in this case, 12% of the representatives of STEM on screen are women, 88% are men. But at 8% enrollment, fact is worse than fiction today. So that's where we are at. And I think not just in terms of labor force imbalance, this also sort of puts a very sharp focus on the pay disparity that will continue to widen, right, between men and women. Because in the US alone, somebody who's in a STEM role is expected to earn twice as much as somebody who is in a non-STEM role. So when the next pandemic happens or somebody has to give up their job to support the family or to shoulder domestic responsibilities, it's going to be the person with the secondary income and it's most likely going to be a woman because if only 8% are enrolling, then how many of them are going to have jobs that pay so well, right? So I think that, uh, I think it's, it is the secret ingredient. So we've been talking about what is the secret ingredient that will sort of put women in the map. And I do think that part of the answer is going to be in science, technology, engineering, and math. But you know, to address the problem in very realistic ways, I think there are three strategies that I would propose. And I'm going to recount them and then get into the details. So the three strategies are digital access, one. The second is financial decision-making or leadership or ownership. And then the third is a decentralized method of measurement. So with the first, I think with digital access, whether it is access to education, to opportunity, to the digital economy, I think there is certainly an imbalance between men and women. 1.7 billion women around the world, mostly in low and middle income countries, are completely unconnected. I think uh, Amina Mohammed also touched on this briefly while she was speaking. And I think what makes it even worse is that uh, when Robert was introducing me, he talked about the fact that India continues to, to lead the world in technology, but even in India, only 29%, 29% of our internet users are women. It looks really bad, right? So I think that if women are not even, if technology is not even accessible to women, if they are not even on the internet, how are they going to be able to contribute meaningfully in a world that is becoming more and more technology centric? The second strategy that I talked about actually touches upon financial ownership or leadership. So I think that as women enter the workforce, once we get them to be connected to technology, there are more women in STEM and other important fields and they're working. To get to being CEOs, I think one of the big gaps is that women are not perceived as financial leaders or decision makers, right? So in companies, we groom them for support functions. We don't groom them for PL roles, right? Which is why they don't become CEO. Similarly, at home, we groom them to be caregivers. We don't groom them to be asset owners and financial decision makers. And I think that is the role that mentorship can play in the world going forward. So as technology connects people from around the world, I think mentors can guide women, generation after generation of women can guide the next tranche of leaders as to how to become financially independent, how to become decision makers. And I think that will truly change the narrative and take us forward. 
And then the last is, uh, this is associated with the work that we do, but also with STEM as a topic, right? So I think that the top-down modes of measurement that have existed for very long now are not going to be successful in the next decade. It is a very agile world. The reality changes every day and it changes at the microscopic level of the individual. And then it aggregates to the meta level. And then, you know, if you're just doing the top down approach, you cannot really capture everything that goes on, right? So I think that a decentralized method of measurement that relies on hyperlocal, intelligent, personalized um, measurement of outcomes is important. So. If, even if we look at something like mentoring, not measuring the number of sessions or mentees or mentors, but measuring outcomes, like did this reduce the instances of violence? Did it improve income or opportunity for the control group? Is I think what we need to be able to conclusively say for our audience in order to be able to do the right things going forward. And I think while we are still on the topic of measurement, Elizabeth, I would like to pass the ball back to you. And I'd like to see if you could share some stats from the work that We Connect has done through the global surveys that it has conducted and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially on women business owners, if you could talk a little bit about that. Thank you for the question, Gagan, and thank you for sharing your powerful womenpreneur story and observations. Uh, today, organizations such as the UN Global Compact and many others that helped to organize this discussion have helped to highlight where we are today on women's economic empowerment. Uh, as you all know, we have a long way to go. Women impact over 80% of all purchasing decisions at the household level. They're 51% of the global population. They own a third of all privately owned businesses. And yet corporations and governments only leverage 1% of their global spend on products and services with women-owned businesses. And yes, I said that on average, only 1% of the spend by large organizations is with women suppliers. We have a long way to go, but uh, uh, We Connect International has been surveying women business owners around the world since March, and it should be no surprise to know that 84% of the women business owners we surveyed have a significant decrease in their sales or revenue. However, these women are resilient. 62% of them are identifying and cutting unnecessary expenses. 43% have shifted to a digital business model and 42% are creating new business lines in response to local or global needs. So I'm really in awe with how these women entrepreneurs are pivoting. Um, and because of COVID, these women business owners are innovating and leveraging technology to connect with new markets and with other women business owners around the world. And in fact, uh, We Connect, we just launched our new We Community. It's a multilingual online platform to connect large buyers with these women suppliers and over 100 countries. And as all of you know, small businesses are the engine of economic growth and job creation. And it's absolutely critical for all businesses to have equal access to markets to sell their products and services. And we're particularly committed to working with all of you to get as much money into the hands of women as fast as possible because of the inclusive and sustainable way women run their businesses and spend their money on their employees families and communities, which very frankly is exactly what we all need to thrive during and after this global pandemic. This is great. This is great input. Uh, amazing also the focus on STEM. I'm all on, on STEM. I mean, uh, the, the data that you provide, Gagan, is, is really uh, the one that, uh, that we should pay attention more. Huh? I think that uh, the, the fact that uh, this lack of of uh, mentality, the lack of also, uh, you, you refer to mentoring, but sometimes the mentoring comes from, from fathers and mothers, isn't it? Uh, at home, and how, how do you really drive your agenda? And Elizabeth, your, your survey also on the digital, the digital approach uh, uh, for women entrepreneurship is great. So I, I, we, are lag, we are lagging very behind on time and Shay is reminding it to me. So I have to be very focused now. Jasmine and Marie, please, can we liaise with this last point on the digital, the digital leverage for entrepreneurs. How can you provide us in terms of contribution? How how you would uh, swift? Uh, how do you push the agenda of uh, entrepreneurship through digital means? That that's also a key driver. The floor is yours. Yeah. You, can, you can do it as quick as you can. Please, we will thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for that question. Throughout my career, I have used digital transformation as a tool to propel women forward. 
One of such examples was the opening of JobLink Recruitment Center in Nigeria. To bring you up to date, as of quarter two, 2020, the Nigerian unemployment rate was 27%, with a female unemployment rate of over 45%. In response uh, to these issues, I had assembled a team and established one of Nigeria's Lagos's first job centers, and JobLink since then has positively disrupted the recruitment industry, connecting women to gainful employment, some of whom may have had low literacy levels or limited access to the internet. The result has been thousands of women being successful in gaining employment, showing technology as a key enabler. Globally, as our economies seek to recover, it is important not to leave anyone behind and use technology to support the vulnerable in societies, carrying them along, always remembering that the toughest people to reach are the ones that need our help the most. As um, Amina J. Mohammed mentioned uh, today, we're really not as connected as we think we are. And from those interviews conducted, we also identified women who had been victims of sexual harassment or gender-based violence at work. And we set up a Power of Women Association, which is essentially a network of lawyers and counselors who offer their services pro bono for free and take on our cases. We're also working to make more permanent policy changes in the Violence Against Persons Act to ensure perpetrators are duly and swiftly charged, really bringing on the justice that we deserve. And so at this point, I would um, pass that question, same question to Jasmine. If you can come in and share with us some of the key ingredients uh, that you believe are key and how we can use technology to empower women in this digital economy. Secretary General, thank you for the opportunity. Mary, thank you for the question. Um, I would look at digital transformation and how we leverage uh, digital technologies. I see it in three big buckets. Technology as a platform is an enabler. We heard from speakers before us how quickly they have moved from um, non-formal sector to becoming online um, entrepreneurs. I think technology as a, as a platform is a, a critical component. Secondly, I think it's very important we look at innovation as culture. Innovation as culture will allow us to recover and allow women to also bring together the different components. Uh, Secretary General, uh, Deputy Secretary General Amina Muhammad actually talked about how do we bring in the various uh, components together. And I think one of the most important factor here is that women who innovate actually bring together a community. And I think that is very important. And thirdly, I think education as in, in digital skilling the digital skilling is going to be one of the most important propellers for women as we move forward, and especially as we recover and look to rebuild our economies. And digital skilling is going to be one of the most important force, um, not only within small communities, but everyone has a duty to now reskill, upskill, and cross skill so that they would be able to innovate. Even if they are faced with challenges and failures, they would be able to recover fast. Um, with that, I'm going to come to you, uh, Mary, with the question, share with us what are the unique challenges young women face today when they are starting out and growing their entrepreneurial businesses, and how can they unlock their potential? Thank you so much, Jasmine. I mean, since the pandemic, we have been operating under perhaps the toughest economic market conditions our generation has ever witnessed. This is prefaced by the reality that a large proportion of women work in hard hit sectors, such as fashion and hospita hospitality like myself as a hotelier. Nevertheless, we must persevere through these trying times while deploying technology solutions for innovation and adaptability. And I'll share from my experience, the Meridina Foundation leads the Zero Hunger Program, which involves distribution of 4 million meal products to internally displaced women and children in crisis regions that have been hard hit by violent attacks. Although the pandemic posed a major threat to our operations, we progressed by using a unique app to capture and process primary data pertaining to our beneficiaries. This system has increased the efficiency of our work by 60%. The system is also scalable and can support our growth plans in 2021 of providing 12 million meals to the most vulnerable in societies. So in addition to innovation for entrepreneurship and to grow businesses, we also must build strong networks and utilize their strength, which is pivotal for marketing, especially in these times as traditional channels are currently subject to many limitations. Remember, 
Your network determines your net worth. It has the power to break glass ceilings and open doors, even in the corridors of power. So the power lies really within us to give ourselves the opportunity to harness our social and interpersonal skills and utilize key mentorship relationships to forge ahead. And don't be afraid to be ambitious. You can only go as far as your vision extends, so dream big. More importantly, have a good heart. If there's anything the pandemic has taught us, it is to show love and support to one another. It is the leaders who use the secret ingredient of empathy in the marketplace that can truly rebuild better. People want leaders who show a spirit to serve their customers, a spirit to serve their employees, and a spirit to serve their communities. I believe women naturally possess this gift of care and empathy. Let us use it now more than ever before to create competitive edge in our unique market spaces. And so coming back to you, Jasmine, what do you believe are the critical tools um, that women need to advance in today's economy and environment? I'm going to sort of share some of the tools that I use. One of the most important ones that I believe in is mentoring. Uh, mentoring young women, especially in, in the technology sector is such an important one. We heard from Gagandip before this, we are already challenged by the numbers. So mentoring, seek out mentors, go look for them. And mentors for the senior women leaders out there, take on young mentees and, and guide them because they are the next generation. Be a serial learner, don't give up learning and believe that the power of power is not in the position that you have to hold or you are holding or that somebody is holding. The power of power is in the intellect, in the kindness and in the humanity that is in you. You do not need to be in a position to make a difference. All of us, women especially, can make a difference. And my, my parting words would be seek out mentorship. Do not be afraid to fail. Have a growth mindset. And most importantly, learn, learn, and learn. Thank you. Thank you so much. And over to you back, um, Secretary General. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Marie. Incredible input. And I think very, very inspiring. Very inspiring. I also have to say that sometimes the mentoring also is need for men and also to remove our barriers because we have also our own mind barriers also to promote women entrepreneurship. So that's also an important point. I give the floor to Shay, who's looking at me also because we are lagging behind in time. Thank you, Shay, for your patience. Well, thank you, Roberto, and thank you for the panel. That was really inspiring words. Now, we have a question and answer section, and I wanted to pose to sort of group these questions together. And I really apologize to Gabriella, who's been very patient, and she said she can stay on a little bit longer. So we may go over by 10 minutes. But I did want to pose these uh, two questions. And Elizabeth and Sima from the first panel. Now, you talked about policy, legislation, and coming from a government perspective, how important it is to really change policies and really try to um, break some of these barriers to give opportunities for women. However, there's also this whole issue, and you've mentioned it, culture, tradition, um, wealth being in the hands and, and often land owned only by men or widows not having support, et cetera. I'd like very quickly to ask you from a legislative point of view, um, from Elizabeth, what is one policy that you think has changed which has really helped women? And maybe um, so, so, um, so, uh, Sima, if you could mention how legislation changed and how you're changing some of the cultural aspects to making sure that this legislation is changed. So Elizabeth, if you could unmic yourself, uh, if you could open your microphone, oh, sorry, unmute yourself. And also um, Sima, because I believe you're still there and would be delighted if you could answer those questions very quickly, just one or two bullets. Sima? Yes. Uh, sorry, I was, uh, uh, I was not able to unmute myself. Uh, I think it is really important to have a good legislation. That is one part of the, the job. But the important part is to make the legislation reality in the ground and implement it. And that is the, the difficult part in countries like us. 
in Afghanistan, for example, because of the continuation of the conflict, because of uh, most of the area is not under control of the government, and also because of the corruption within the system. So that is something that we need to stand uh, firm uh, in order to change that reality. The, the, the other sentence that I would like to mention, and I and was really inspired by the uh, discussion by other, our other colleagues and sisters around the world, is that I, as, a, as an Afghan woman, would like to call on our sisters and the participant of this, word, uh, this program that uh, the, we need your solidarity and please stand with us. We do not want to go back uh, in order to, to be in the same uh, problem as I uh, described. Uh, and also would like to mention that the women's existence and ability should be recognized and acknowledged and then include them in the decision making and then support them because we cannot really uh, deal with the, such a let's say male dominated environment and and uh, people who decide in the gulf or in the and the other uh, kind of gathering in our case in the jirgas around and when they are sitting and then deciding uh, several issues and putting uh, uh, a lot of restriction and impose on women's ability in movement. Okay. I Thank stop in order to give the time to the other colleague. Thank you so much. Um, and I believe Elizabeth may have left. And so I just wanted to ask one last question. I'm putting you both on the spot. Um, Jasmine and also Gandeep, you spoke an awful lot about how IT skills and STEM education is so critical and that we really need to get women and girls into these programs. But I read a study where they were saying that actually girls go into mathematics, they um, take some of these courses, but then they leave and they're not as interested. So how do we change and get more girls into this sort of STEM education, mathematics, engineering, et cetera. Is there some sort of lessons learned that you've seen to encourage them to go into these sort of professions? Hi, thank you, Shay. And I think uh, I can go first. I'm so glad you're asking this question. So it's very interesting. A series of studies have happened over the years where, you know, not just with maths, but also with coding, there have been comparisons of small kids, boys and girls to see what makes them stay and what makes them leave, right? And there are two factors that emerge. Both are very interesting. The first one I think is that the public perception of a scientist or somebody in math is a bespectral sort of, you know, Einstein sort of man. And that's the image that everyone draws. In mm -hmm. fact, in one of the research papers that I was reading, I think 28 out of 4,837 images were of a woman in STEM. And guess what? All 28, so very low percentage, and all 28 came from little girls. So this was, you know, classes K to five, I think, that were drawing the image of a person in STEM. And in every single case, it was exactly what Einstein looked like. So I think role models are missing. And then the second piece, which I think is very exciting from the perspective of the work that needs to happen, is that in objective studies of coding, to see interest and ability, when boys and girls are given problems to solve. If they have to solve problems alone, boys tend to do better by seven points. If they, if they have to solve problems collaboratively, girls tend to perform better by 40 points, four zero. That's a hell of a lot of a difference. So I think we need to shift our mindset around how we are trying to solve problems, how we are introducing education to children. So if girls are better at working collaboratively and are able to bring that to science and technology, maybe education needs to adapt rather than evolution adapting, right? Because I think that's, that's what sort of makes sense, yeah. Jasmine, do you have some words to add? Um, thank you, Shay. Um, I think the challenge we see with women going into STEM and then staying is that, again, the role of a woman that is societal 
perception is that just like um, Gagandip just said that we there is that societal pressure that that is expected of a woman uh, and that she is not the first digital responder. Um, it is seen that men are the first digital responders and th that we are not comfortable uh, seeing women as uh, as scientists or as mathematician. And that is a societal pressure that we see. I think what is important for us is to actually remove this gender lens when it comes to STEM and, and not put a pressure of, of you know, and even as, as, as an Asian woman growing up, it is always put in our heads that a boy would be better in maths and a girl would be better in home science. Uh, and I think that cultural and societal pressure needs to be debunked. And I think women have done fantastically um, and we need to recognize, we need to celebrate women in, in science and technology and we need to uh, recognize their contribution. And, and Microsoft did a study where we wanted to know, do, do girls know women inventors? And the, the survey came back to show that most girls, it's not taught in university, uh, in school even, that they would know Marie Curie and no one else. Whereas we know how much women have contributed to science and technology. And, and I think it is critical at this point to show that women innovate women make a difference and that we celebrate women scientists. I think that that is something that we want to continue to show also from a parity is going to be critical as we move forward. Great, thank you for that. And Elizabeth, do you have very quickly just one or two points you would like to add? No, I just think all of us need to be very thoughtful in how we do the storytelling um, and write our own story. I think that's it's really critical and to make sure that when we have an opportunity to hire an expert um, who's a technologist that we make sure that we give those opportunities um, to the most qualified and we ensure that women are a part of that pool of candidates. Um, that's how these women who are starting technology businesses are going to be able to grow is because uh, we all buy from them um, and encourage them to scale and to hire people and to uh, be a role model for other women and girls who aspire um, to start and grow businesses as well as boys and men can can obviously be inspired by women uh, who have technology businesses so I, I like to keep it simple um, uh, but there are practical ways that we can all make changes immediately thank you so much those were those were great answers and now our final speaker, uh, not last but not least, is Gabriella Rigg Herzl, our Vice President of Labor Affairs and Corporate Responsibility at the United States Council for International Business. Thank you so much, um, Gabriella, for joining us a little bit late, but we really would like to hear from you some inspiring concluding, concluding remarks. Gabriella. The one who's inspired Shay is me and all of our listeners you've had, I don't know, it was like some 100, 130, 140 participants today. Kudos to the organizers today, IOE, um, the UN Global Compact, and also the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung Foundation for today's inspirational and necessary conversation about women's economic empowerment. On behalf of the United States Council for, uh, for uh, on behalf of the United States Council for International Business, I'm pleased and honored and daunted uh, to try and offer some uh, summary uh, observations. Um, it was a, an exceptional conversation today um, in the context of COVID-19, in particular. Our economy is contracting um, because of the health-related impacts, and women are more affected. Um, we had so many quotes today uh, from the inspirational speakers, uh, Seema from Afghanistan talking about the need for truth, truth telling about the real challenges being faced by women and women entrepreneurs at the national levels. And from Uganda about how we need to bring men along. Yes, let's focus on women and empowering women. But let's not forget the other 50% that need to be brought along on this important priority of empowering women to participate equally and fully in the economy. It's a, 
it's a rights issue. Um, it's a um, equality issue, but it's also um, a, an economic benefit value for all, for our economies, for our businesses, for our families, for our communities. So we've got to bring those men along as well across all sectors of society. Laura from Uruguay, how impressive. Laura, I mean, she's right. The decisions are happening, not just in the formal settings in, in the workplace, but also in these informal settings. If we don't know how to golf and it's not our thing to learn how to golf, and if we can't crack into those networks, let's make our own networks. And Laura offered a strong example of making our own networks at home as well. Elizabeth from Germany, it is a long fight. The power of statistics and data that Elizabeth was highlighting are, is irrefutable. The numbers don't lie. And the numbers show that um, you know there's more work to be done. It is a long fight. Representation is critical. And it's important to recruit women into organizations. Um, Elizabeth Vasquez, we connect. Uh, what an amazing organization. Look it up on the internet. work to connect those women entrepreneurs in over 100 countries with the buyers, with those who are in a position to make decisions about economic spend that can help grow small businesses and help grow economies. Elizabeth noted that uh, women-owned businesses So it's really uh, critical for us to be investing and leveraging important networks like WeConnect. Um, Elizabeth also talked about the need, especially now in this pandemic, for, for all small businesses, uh, but especially women, owned, uh, women entrepreneurs to be dynamic, to be ready to pivot, to understand their markets during this challenging time and be ready to understand um, how to modify your offerings so that you can be resilient and come out um, strong and prepared on the other end of this pandemic. Again, uh, the importance of STEM um, education as a secret ingredient, I, we all agree, uh, and the need for access to STEM education for women and girls. Mary, about perseverance. Um, and just uh, understanding, as um, Elizabeth from Germany told us, it's a long fight, uh, but it's the right one, and it's to the benefit of, of our families and society and our economies. So we've been informed um, about the needs. We've um, been inspired by examples, and now is the time for action. We kicked off, um, Amina Mohammed talked to us about the UN 2030 agenda as a unifying framework to, that's critical. Um, we learned in terms of action about the need to strengthen and deepen partnerships at global levels through multilateral uh, organizations like the United Nations, global um, settings like WeConnect or the International Organization of Employers, global kind of aggregators uh, for action and partnership. Uh, and also, well, global, but then also at the national levels as well, national action. In each case, either at the global or the national level, partnerships, governments, employers, civil society, workers, and, and a lot of agenda can be a unifying um, framework for us. Um, importantly, I wanted to when they're looking at employment, education, taxation, or finance policies, whatever it is, they need to make sure that they have it in mind to be fostering women's economic empowerment and participation in labor markets. Um, education policy, um, non-discrimination, and social policies in particular include parental leave and access to affordable care, child care. So thank you again. Uh, it was a daunting task to summarize, but I'm inspired for action. Um, and uh, I know that the IOE is inspired as well. They're going to be launching mentoring programs to um, incentivize their own national members to um, have more women in the leadership in their own organizations as well. So let's all um, take action.
Let's take especially uh, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Muhammad's advice. Let's be focused, learn from our mistakes, make each step count, and go for gold. Thank you so much, and especially um, wishing everyone a very happy and healthy new year. Thank you, Shay. Thank you so much, Gabriella. That was a wonderful um, summary of so many wonderful, great thoughts. Um, but as she says, action. And so we're all on the screen. Let's make sure we keep connected. Let's help one another. We are sisters. We do need to work with our brothers. Um, but let's make sure that we do get involved. And when I say that, in January, there will be events coming up. Please look at the websites um, of the UN, of the IOE, of the business and industry group. But in January, there will be a, a Women Rise for All event. And also in March, we will be partnering with the Global Compact on another event where we're really looking at action on mentorship and um, really trying to bring the right people around the table to really ha help us re reach our Agenda 2030. So thank you so much. However, before I leave, I must say, all of this would not have been possible without the help of a fantastic team. I'd like to really say a special thank you to Angela Gulovic, to Mohira Kurbanova, to Monique Derpierre, Jean Milligan, and the comms teams from IOE and also the Global Compact, but most importantly, our interpreters today. Thank you so much. And as we go into this holiday season, have a happy holidays, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much.